This is a recent crime scene. This is a truck driver who is getting arrested on the border to a small country in northern Europe. And the crime is illegal smuggling of butter. <laughs> so, why would anybody smuggle butter into a country? Well, it's because it's all gone. There is no butter in the stores. People ate it all, and they want more. So, <laughs> this kind of strange story started three decades ago, in 1984. And this is the year that George Orwell chose for his novel, 1984, about Big Brother. So in the same year, fittingly, a large campaign was launched by the American government to teach people to fear fat with no real proof that this could help prevent heart disease. And in hindsight, we should, it's kind of easy to see the problem, is that you, if you eat a lot, lot less fat, you will eat more carbohydrates, your blood sugar will go up, your fat storing hormone insulin will go up, and this is what happened. So this is obesity statistics from the US in 1985. The white states, we don't have any certain data, but in the blue states, there are around 10% Obesity, so, so let's move ahead two years at a time. Have a close look and see if you can spot the difference. 87, 89, 91, 93, and 1995. And there's a new color covering half the nation, dark blue. That's over 15% obesity. So it's up 50% in a decade. Let's move on. 97, 99, 01, 03, 05, 7, 9, 2011, 2014. And it's, yeah, we're in Colorado. It was still yellow, but that's still 20% obesity. It's twice what it was just a few short decades ago. Orange, 25%, red, 30%, and black, 35%. And there's even um, surveys from last year showing that it's even worse now than in 2014, so it's getting worse all the time. Obese Americans have become common. In just a few decades, obesity rates have tripled in one generation, and we have a giant problem that's not going away, it's getting worse. Extreme obesity is exploding in America, so how can we stop this, turn it around? Maybe we can learn something from where I come from, which is a tiny country in Northern Europe called Sweden. And there are nine million of us, and we're known for three things now. First one is the pop group ABBA. <laughs> Second one is the Nobel Prize. And the third one is fad diets. <laughs> this is a, a, an article from The Lancet a few years ago called Fad Diets in Sweden of All Places. And these authors were horrified by the popularity of something really dangerous called LCHF. It was so popular in Sweden and looks like this. And as you can see, it's quite toxic. <laughs> Probably gonna kill you if you try to eat any of that. You avoid sugar and starches and you eat all the other foods you like. So it's yeah, like similar to other low carb diets, but get enough high fat as well. So, this is something that Sweden has desperately been needing, something new at least, because we've had a similar experience as in the US. This is statistics on the sales of butter in Sweden from 1985 up to 2008. And you can see it went down to less than half. So what happened, happened to overweight and obesity in the same, same time period? We have quite good statistics and yeah, it's like a mirror image. So as, as we ate less fat, we also got more obesity. But you can see in the butter curve here, it sort of starts going up there in 2008. Do you want to know what's happened since then? A quite nice butter comeback <laughs> in Sweden. <laughs> and obviously, as people started eating all that fat again, they must have gotten really obese, right? Actually, no. Suddenly, and this is kind of unique in the world actually, the obesity epidemic seems to have stopped. It's stuck at 14% obesity, and for comparison, the US is at 38 and going up. So 
something interesting is happening. This started in a very inauspicious way in 2005. Started with a doctor called Annika Dahlqvist, a family doctor. She discovered low carb herself. She lost weight. She felt great. And then she started to give the same advice to her patients. And they lost weight with no hunger. Their diabetes often went away. And she started the blog. She ended up in the media, TV, papers. And this became a big thing. And then a couple of dietitians got really worried about this. And they were worrying that people were going to die from you know, butter intoxication all over the place. <laughs> and so they notified the, the National Board of Health and Welfare. And they have the power to take away her medical license if they choose, or tell her to absolutely stop doing this. But they discovered they had to review the science for two years to come to a conclusion about this. And in January of 2008, they came to their conclusion, the verdict, and they said, OK, you can keep doing this, no problem. Everybody was very surprised. So they said that low-carb diets today can be seen as compatible with scientific evidence and best practice for losing weight. As it's been proven in studies that it works, at least as long as people follow it. And there is no evidence that it's dangerous. So this was quite a re revolution in the debate. So LCHF went from this dangerous fad diet overnight to sort of approved by the government diet. And everybody jumped on it. So <clears throat> you can track this in different ways. I like statistics online. You know you can see statistics on Google searches, for, you know, for example, for Sweden. So um, here is the statistics for all the most popular diets in Sweden. And the blue one is low carb, high fat. And you can see here, this is 2008. Like almost nobody is Googling for it. Can't even see it. But then it goes up and up and up. And in 2010, it became the most popular diet online in Sweden. So what happened after that? Did it pass into, you know, did we forget about it like any other fad diet? No. It's like by far the biggest. It's actually more popular than every other popular diet combined. And uh, this is up to 2015. I actually updated this for this talk. This is to 2016. And you can see it's like peaked here in, in 2012 and 13. And that's when you couldn't open a paper without reading about this. Couldn't turn on the TV without <coughs> seeing something about this. Um, so it was really in the media all the time. But then after a few years, something happened. The media got bored. You know, the media, they always need, they need a new thing. They can't sell papers or get viewers by telling people the same thing year after year. So now it's not in the papers. It's not on the TV. But it's still by far the most popular online. And uh, offline, I, just last weekend, actually, we had the annual low-carb cruise. And sorry, Jimmy, it's actually the biggest low-carb cruise in, <laughs> in the world. It's more than 600 people, the, the most the cruise ship can take in the conference section. So it was sold out far in advance. And yeah, it's going strong. Some surveys have claimed that about 23% of Swedes try to eat a low-carb diet of some kind. And it's also spilled into our neighboring countries. This was on the border to Norway. <laughs> the Norwegian butter crisis actually <laughs> ended up on the Stephen Colbert report here. Quite funny. You can see it online if you want to. And here's a, a one-page newspaper ad from Norway. Uh, you buy this Audi R8, a $300,000 car. They will send you a pound of butter for free. <laughs> So it sounds a little bit faddish. Is it a fad? Is it a you know, temporary thing? I'm going to say no, of course, for a very simple reason. It works. Lots of people know that. Studies show it. It works. So perhaps it's time to ask the other question. Is low fat a fad diet? Because this pyramid or the my plate thing is all based on this old idea that cholesterol, fat in the diet raises cholesterol, gives you heart disease. Uh, but as, as most of you know, 
this has no evidence. In fact, if you look at all the evidence, there's no significant association even between eating butter and, and heart disease. And, and you've never been able to show that it gives you heart disease. So for example, a professor in Sweden called Jörn Berglund, he said this, two generations of Swedes have been given bad dietary advice and have avoided fat for no reason. It is time to rewrite the dietary guidelines and base them on modern science. Okay, so this is what's been happening. More butter, the obesity epidemic halted. What has happened to the heart disease frequency in Sweden? You know, Swedes, we are extremely good at making statistics. We're quite a boring people, actually. You know, statistics is, is like what we do best. So we have perfect, perfect statistics from this. <laughs> and, and you'd think that the curves are going up, but they're not. So this is from 1990 up to 2013, 14. I added for 2014 there with arrows. And it's going straight down. So the top line is for men. You know, men are at higher risk, right? And the bottom one is for women. It's actually gone down by half. In that period, if you see here the slightly green period where low carb has been very popular. It's going down faster than ever. So if you add a graph over the butter consumption, you see <laughs> an interesting coincidence. We're eating twice as much butter and we get half as much heart disease. So it's like another paradox to add to the thousands of paradoxes out there when it comes to saturated fat and heart disease. Of course, it's not a paradox. It's just a sign that the theory is wrong. So we have a paradigm shift going on all across the world. This is just an example of it. Used to believe that saturated fat was bad. We're going to see it's safe. Used to believe that carbohydrates are good. And uh, we're going to see that too much carbohydrates can make you fat and sick, especially bad carbs like sugar, flour. When it comes to saturated fat, this is another professor from Sweden, Peter Nilsson. He said this, it's time to face the facts. There is no connection between saturated fats and cardiovascular disease. So where are we now? How many people have seen this? Uh, the headline says, Sweden becomes the first Western nation to reject low-fat dietary dogma in favor of low-carb, high-fat nutrition. How many people have seen it? Quite a few people. 53,000 shares on Facebook, quite a lot. Unfortunately, unfortunately or, or, you know, reality is this is not true. We, we have the same, basically, guidelines. What this is referring to is this, a government expert review about dietary treatment for obesity. OK, and this one came to the conclusion, looking at all the science, that if you want to lose weight, then low-carb, high-fat diets are more effective when you follow them. So excuse the Swedish headlines. It says, maybe somebody knows it. <laughs> Uh, it says that, that low-carb, high-fat is best for quick weight loss, best for losing weight, uh, most effective diets, and so on. So then perhaps you see the problem with this. It's not something we're giving av advice for the, the entire population. This is about the best diet for treating obesity, right? Even though like half the population are at least overweight in Sweden, so <laughs> maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But, but the thing is, what we have proven, what there is evidence for, is that low carb is more effective for weight loss. So we're at least 20 randomized controlled trials showing this, people losing more weight on low carb. But still, even in Sweden, people are taking a long time changing because when someone goes to their doctor or their dietitian and asks for help, right? They don't often get told to eat low carb. They get told to eat less calories, move more, which is basically this advice that has been shown to lose over and over again when you compare it to low carb. So quite sad. And when people fail doing this, which most people do eventually, we don't say, OK, let's try low carb instead. No. What do we do? 
we advised them to have surgery, bariatric surgery, where they cut away a big part of the stomach, part of the intestines. Is there a disease in these organs? No. These are healthy organs that we are removing, right? So we're trying to surgically modify our bodies to sort of tolerate the industrial food slightly better, instead of actually eating food that our bodies can handle. I think that's a bit crazy. And <clears throat> the most common argument for this, for people defending it, is that, OK, the people who end up on the operating table, they have already tested everything else, right? So this is the final solution. There is nothing else. But it's a lie, because lots of people haven't tried what works best. And this is just one example out of you know, any number. This is Johanna Engström. When she was 41 year, years old, she felt that she had struggled with her weight for long enough. So she decided she wanted the surgery. And she got on the list for it. And then the day before she was going to be operated on, she decided she couldn't go through with it. She felt just felt deeply wrong to her. She couldn't do it. So she talked to the hospital people. And she said, I'm really, really, really sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to give the surgery for someone else. I can't do it. OK, and she went home. And then she started eating low carb, high fat, which is something she'd been thinking about for a long time. But she'd never given, given it a, a real, real try. She actually asked her doctor about it. And he said, don't do it, because it doesn't work. And it's dangerous. But she tested it anyway. And in a year, she lost more than 100 pounds with no hunger, looked like this afterwards, with all her healthy organs intact. right? And you'd wish more people got that opportunity, at least, to try it. Why not? Because doctors, like me, once in a while, and, and dietitians and nurses, they feel that this thing, you know, having an omelette with mushrooms for breakfast is way too extreme to even contemplate, <laughs> right? So instead, we cut away healthy organs on thousands of people because we're too afraid to tell them to eat real food. It is that insane. And it can get worse because these surgeries, you know, they work fantastically well for a year or so. People lose a tremendous amount of weight often. But then the weight starts coming back. If people don't change their lifestyle, it goes up again. And it's quite common for people to regain all that weight and even more. So what do you do? Well, people are experimenting with all kinds of things. For example, <coughs> brain implants, <laughs> electrodes into the reward system of the brain to tell the brain it doesn't really want any food, right? Uh, Really, nothing says 1984 like brain implants, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it can get worse. Another quite popular, amazingly so, a popular option now is to put a tube into the stomach that hangs out underneath your clothing, right? And the idea is you, you eat your food, and then you go to the bathroom, pull up your shirt, pull out the tube, and pour the food into the toilet. So it's like... It's like doctor prescribed bulimia, right? Yeah. yeah. And you don't even need a tube because you already have a tube. <laughs> so. <laughs> but anyway, there's no money to be made from that. So. Why not try something really, really extreme instead, like eating real food? Here's uh, a friend of mine called Ronnie Mattison, Norwegian guy. Uh, I didn't know him at this time. This is a few years ago. But I know him now. He uh, got tired of, of being overweight, so he wrote on his Facebook page, can you possibly lose 20 pounds in 10 weeks? Is it possible? And a friend answered, yeah, it's possible with low carb. So Ronnie tested it. And he did something unusual first. He, he took a picture of himself in underwear before and after. And then he put these images into his computer and, and made it cal calculate how he looked in between the images. So it's like a movie. Check it out. This is Ronnie while he's eating all the low-carb, high-fat food he wants. And the fat sort of melts away. 70 pounds. Here's from the side. 
pretty cool, right? I mean, of course, it doesn't work this well in everybody, but it works really well in a lot of people, and it's worth testing it. Of course, it's not just about weight. You know that. This is about health, at least as much, and especially diabetes. So diabetes is diseases where you have too much sugar in your blood, of course. And the sugar in the blood comes from the carbohydrates we eat, right? It's what turns into sugar. So in 1985, we have had 30 million diabetics type 2 in the world. How many people are there today? 450, 14 times more in just a few decades. decades. It's insane. And it's just going up. 2040 prognosis, 642 million. So like a large part of humanity. And they're not getting well. They're getting sicker every year. They get complications, blindness, dementia, heart disease, kidney disease, amputations. And it could all be because they get sick. Dietary advice. Diet pyramid, the bottom is starchy foods, the exact foods that raise the blood sugar. And of course, if you look at the my plate, same thing. It is sugar, starch, and sugar again. And I get kind of depressed. I get really depressed, actually, when things get worse. We're supposed to you know, move into a beautiful, bright future, right? Things are supposed to get better. But sometimes things get worse. 100 years ago, people treated diabetes completely differently. Before we had modern drugs to cover this, the problem, before we were afraid of fat, here is a cookbook for diabetes from 1917. You can read it online if you like. I'm just going to show you the most interesting thing, which is page 12 and 13. To the left, the foods you are supposed to eat. To the right, the foods you are not supposed to eat. So have a look to the right. Foods that you should not eat, number one is sugar. Number two is starchy foods. And you have examples like flour, bread, biscuits, rice, and macaroni, what we call pasta today. Check out the headline on this page. Foods strictly forbidden, which is now the base of the food pyramid, the largest part <laughs> of the my plate, you know? When we have an explosion of diabetes all ar around the world, people are getting sicker and sicker. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. I think that's it's the cause. So look to the left. What were people supposed to be eating back then? What is it? Butter, olive oil, cheese, meat, fish, and eggs. Yeah, and if, if we only add a bunch of vegetables to this, then it's low carb, high fat, right? Same advice I've given to patients for 10 years. And everybody with diabetes who tested this got better blood sugar. And it's not strange, because blood sugar comes from the carbs you eat. Take them away, you bring down blood sugar. It just, just makes perfect sense. It's not rocket science, but there is science. So I'm not going to go through all that. I don't have the time, unfortunately. You can read it on, on my website if you like. I'm sure other people are going to talk about it. But you actually don't need, if you don't want to, you, you don't need to, to read a lot of science. You can test this yourself with a simple blood glucose monitor. So here's food I had a while back. Here's a, a big piece of meat fried in butter. We have uh, a few grams of carbs from uh, vegetables fried in butter. And then there's homemade bernet sauce, which is, of course, melted butter and egg yolks, right? <laughs> so it's like a nightmare for an old-fashioned uh, dietitian, right? It's like a bomb of all saturated fat and no carbs. A few grams. You can, when you eat this, you can almost feel your, your brain starts to stop, it stops working, right? From glucose deficiency. <laughs> Has anybody experienced that? No? Me neither. <laughs> anyway. What happens to blood sugar? Uh, normal range is between you know, 70 and 100 or so. And uh, I tested my blood sugar after eating this. And this is what happened. So I had quite a boring evening, actually, pricking my finger. Nothing, absolutely nothing happened. Uh, stayed around 90. 
you don't eat carbs, you don't get that blood sugar elevation. For contrast, of course, then I went to the largest obesity conference in the world, the International Congress of Obesity. In 2010, it was in Stockholm, Sweden. Of course, I had to go. And they served me the worst lunch I ever had <laughs> for a very long time. And here's how it looks. <clears throat> I mean, it actually says on the sign, if you're wondering, International Congress of Obesity 2010 Stockholm, today's lunch. And here's what all of it looked like. And it's, of course, it's sugar in the candy, it's plenty of added sugar in the yogurt, it's sugar in the apple with some nice fiber in there also, and then there's pure starch in the sandwich. It really is, because I was hoping for something like you know, protein, fat, something good, tasty inside. But I was really disappointed because this is supposed, supposed to be a tuna sandwich, but really that's a homeopathic dose in, in my own. So I, don't, I don't count that. It's all, all sugar and stuff. So what, what happened? Check it out. 180. It's like my record. I was almost proud. And then it crashes. You see, crashes and I got really hungry. It's like... Mm, I want to eat something. I didn't, but, but you know, that's what happens. You, get, you, you feel full for 15 minutes, and then you feel hungry again, and you gain weight. Unfortunately, this is almost exactly what people with diabetes are told to eat. It's not much different. You know? And they can't, they're not going to stop at 180. They're going to go to you know, 300, 400, 500, who knows. <clears throat> Here is a brochure from um, Sweden. It says food for people with diabetes. You can see the, you see the fruit and you know what's coming, right? Uh, it says, foods that raises the blood sugar slowly is good. And what is that? Fruit, rice, pasta, potatoes, and bread. Oh, it, does, it raises the blood sugar for sure. So who gives out these, these you know, brochures for free? Who is printing them? It is a pharmaceutical company, right? So they sell drugs for lowering blood sugar. And then they hand out brochures to help people raise their blood sugar. So people with diabetes get sicker. Blood sugar goes up. They need more drugs. Company makes more money. Shareholders are very happy. Everybody else loses. I don't think pharmaceutical companies should have anything to do with dietary guidelines or lifestyle guidance at all. Because they are misaligned. This is the biggest diabetes conference in the world. It's in Vienna this year. Uh, I went there, I had lunch, <laughs> here they're serving the lunch. Guess what's in the bags? <laughs> Another fantastic lunch. And of course I had to test my blood sugar. And, yeah. So it can feel like oh, total darkness, but at least there is some sort of hope on the horizon perhaps. I went to a low carb high fat conference in South Africa last year, how many people were there? Quite a few, yeah. That lunch did not look the same. Now here's pictures from that conference, you know, real food that helps people get a good weight, good health. So these people don't get it. This is the largest obesity conference in the world and they're serving food that makes people obese, right? And here's the largest diabetes conference and they serve food that gives people diabetes. It's crazy. And here is uh, the biggest low-carb high food conference, and uh, yeah, they serve good food, so always something. Quickly, this is uh, another hopeful sign from Sweden. It's official government guidance for people with diabetes, what to eat. And they actually say now that at least a moderate low-carb diet is an excellent choice for people with type 2 diabetes. So we're moving in the right direction. We had this... Uh, government uh, thing saying that you know it's okay to give this sort of advice in 20, 2008 and then you know it's okay moderate low carb is good for diabetes uh, strict low carb is the best way to lose weight at least some movement right and one of the government experts a professor Fredrik Nyström said this when uh, all recent scientific reports are lined up the result is clear our deeply rooted fear of fat has been a mistake and you don't get fat from eating fat, just like you don't become green by eating vegetables. <laughs> so 
some hopeful things happening, you know, and, and, and of course this is an international thing. It's obviously not just in Sweden, it's all over the world. Uh, this is 1984, and I'm sure many of you saw this, 2014, eat butter. And it says below there, it says, scientists labeled fat the enemy, why they were wrong. And this stuff that's going on, it's really important. Here's, here's why it's important. This is me, Vesterdal, before and after she started eating low carb, took control of her sugar addiction and lost 174 pounds. Actually, she, she's, she's lost 200 pounds now. This is Marie Sermon, who didn't just lose weight, but she also lost her type 2 diabetes. Seems to be gone. And this uh, is Josephine Larsson, one of every, all these young people with weight issues. And she never had to be hungry to become thin again. And of, of course, more people need to get the chance, right? So how do we, people in this room, other people, how can we help this to happen sooner? Because there's quite a lot of resistance, right? These huge companies, they want to maintain the profitable status quo, just like the cigarette industry 50 years ago. So a lot of the change has to come from the bottom, I believe. And you know, I started a blog to do my little thing uh, in Sweden eight years ago, and it's been an exciting journey. I, I knew nothing about blogging when I started writing. Lots of people write better than me, and uh, of course, lots of people dress better than me, <laughs> which could be important. You know, this is the biggest blogger in Sweden. She's called Kinsa. And I thought, you know, yeah, they share their daily outfits and lots of people turn up to look at it. And I, I thought if I did the same thing, surely. <laughs> <laughs> must work, must work. But, but yeah, it's kind of a failed experiment, experiment. So I had to, had to move on from that and, and write about things I know about, like diet and health. Boring stuff. Uh, but still, it's boring stuff, but 500 people showed up every day after a month. And after one year, 5,000. And then suddenly tens of thousands. And then I tried to do an English version of the blog called Diet Doctor. And now it's 100,000 people every day. So people want to know about this. And, and we can you know, make a difference using the internet. We have enormous possibilities. Nobody had these kind of possibilities before, right? And yeah, this is in Sweden, low carb high fat, the, by far the biggest for a long time. What about the US? Here is US Google searches for LCHF. It starts in 2011, so a bit later, but you see it's going up quite, quite fast, right? And I like the term LCHF. It's not branded, it's just saying what it is, right? Low carb high fat, hard to not understand. So, okay, so lots of people see, seem interested in this. There's this opportunity to to help a lot of people. Here's the clinic where I, where I worked for nine years. And uh, yeah, I saw patients, one person at a time. But what, do you, what if you believe that it's possible that you can help 10 people in that time? Or maybe 100 people, maybe even in the future 1,000 people, who knows? Can you still do it? I sort of felt like if I, if I believed in that myself, I had to quit and focus all my attention on these other things. So I did, a year ago, I quit this job, which I, I did love, uh, for something I love even more, which is this American um, English site. And uh, of course, I also know that you know, one person can really change much in the world. It's just too much. You know. But perhaps you can start an organization that can grow and really make a difference. So that's what I wanted to do. And if you want to build an organization, you want to hire people, pay them fair wages, you need revenue, right? I don't want to have ads. To have, we have zero ads, hate ads. Um, don't sell any products, actually, either. I don't really like that either. Um, and most importantly, we take no money from the food industry or pharmaceutical industry. That's like the fastest way to get corrupted, right? So what we decided to do is we give away you know, everything people need for free, but then we have like a membership section with extra stuff. If people are interested or they just want to support this. Uh, and even that is free for a month to test it. So we, we started that a bit more than a year ago. We like you know, interviews, presentations, movies, video courses, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, a lot of people said this is never going to work because everything has to be free all the time on the internet. Nobody's ever going to pay for anything there. 
Um, but we tested it anyway, free for a month, $9 if you want to stay after that per month, like Netflix, love Netflix. <laughs> so what happened? Actually, the people who thought that nobody would ever sign up were wrong because we hit 14,000 now. Wow. And you can make, do the math, it's quite a lot of you know, revenue. So what do you do with that? Well, we use all of it to reach our goal, which is to help people. Uh, so we're now with we six people working full time. We're one working part time, and many many people freelancers. So Simon is a full time employee, for example. Max here and Isabella are freelancers, coming here recording stuff. And the cool thing I think is that we are only funded by the people. So our only interest, our alignment, is to help people, right? Completely independent, which is important. Growing exponentially, more than doubling in size every year. So it's it's getting exciting. Finally, to end this presentation, <clears throat> a short video. And, and two, two of the people in it are actually here today. It's uh, Maureen Brenner and Desi Miller. Um, this video is, is, is why we exist. I'll just kind of start with the beginning. I always struggled with weight. I just need to tell people I have been on a number of diets. By this time, I was on two different diabetic medications. I used to really feel like the weight was like some kind of moral failing. It's hard, you know, it's hard because um, people are saying it's not good for you, you shouldn't do that. I had tried everything by the book. Here's another doctor. He's gonna tell me I need to eat 800 calories and exercise an hour a day. Every diet I've been on, they always tell me, lower your fat. I came across the low carb, high fat thing. I tried it mm -hmm. for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I tried it. So and what happened? Then the weight started to come down. And uh, in a year, I lost 64 pounds. And that is where I lost the most weight without being hungry. Two and a half years later, I went from 374 pounds to 139 pounds. No, no surgery. That's incredible. No surgery. It is. It's a miracle. My blood sugar all of a sudden was just rock bottom. Clicking my belt on the airplane. It's totally different. Totally different. It's fantastic. The energy. And then the other thing, which is why I'm so sure I won't be on antidepressants again, is the mental clarity I've gained. I think for me, the biggest benefit, more than the weight, is the mental clarity, the calmness. I don't feel so impulsive. I, I feel like work-wise, I can be more focused on projects and get through projects better. It's very hard, I think, to convince people uh, until they pr can prove it to themselves. I don't think of it as a diet anymore. It's a lifestyle. People are amazed at what I've done. So what we want to do is to make these journeys simpler, to make low carbs simple, to empower people everywhere to revolutionize their health. And you can be a part of that too. Thank you very much.